Hello and welcome to today's webinar entitled Better Together Microsoft Office 365 and Cisco Email Security. My name is Dennis Donnelly and I lead a team of security specialists here at Cisco. I'm joined today by Bradley Anstis, who's our email security specialist for Asia Pacific. Welcome, Bradley. Thanks, Dennis. Good to be here. Our webinar today is going to answer one of the questions that myself and my team get asked very frequently. And that is, do I really need to run a separate email security solution in addition to Microsoft Office 365? It's a deceptively simple question, but the answer is a little bit more complex because it takes into account email management, security efficacy, and a multitude of other factors around email security. Uh, Brian, I'm sure you get asked that same question. Can you give us your thoughts? Thanks, Dennis. And uh, yes, it's the question I get asked most often out in the field as well. A lot of people confused about exactly you know, what they do need uh, to be running with Office 365. You know, Office 365 is an amazing platform. Uh, I have not seen such a transformational technology in the marketplace for a long time. Uh, when I'm out talking to customers all over Asia Pacific, there seems to be three types of customers that I talk to. You know, the first type of customer is a customer that's already migrated to Office 365 and enjoying all those fantastic benefits. The second type of customer is a customer that's in the middle of their migration uh, to Office 365. Uh, and then the third type of customer is the one that's just trying to work out when they're going to migrate to Office 365. Yes, there are other options to Office 365, but uh, you know, I very rarely come across those in the marketplace. So the big question really is around you know, whether they need that external uh, email security solution. And customers need to be very careful to make an informed, considered decision. And that's what we're going to get into today. Uh, and Gartner also uh, have something to say in this area as well. Uh, they're saying the next couple of years, over 50% of Office 365 customers will be relying on that third-party email security solution. So that seems to be a, a maybe. <laughs> um, so what I'm hearing is if you have a cloud-based email hosting solution, you need a cloud-based email security solution. Maybe we can start with that. Actually, that's a very common misconception, Dennis. Um, you do not need to migrate your email security to the cloud to support Office 365. If you're running an on-premise email security appliance, as you probably were with Exchange On-Prem, uh, for example, then there's no reason why that on-premise email security appliance can't actually forward your email to uh, your Office 365 tenancy. There's no reason why that can't be supported. You're already going through a big transformational change migrating to Office 365. Why add email security on top of that at the same time? So your incoming email can still be supported by your on-premise email security appliance. Email uh, is addressed by using MX records or mail exchange records. Uh, they'll continue to be pointed at your local email security appliance, and that email security appliance can simply uh, redirect your email after it's been processed into your Office 365 tenancy. So there's no reason to actually migrate at that same time. Now, before everybody gets up in arms about this, sure, it's not the most uh, efficient solution to have long term because you're basically tromboning that email up and down from the actual internet. So sure, it may not be where you want to stay long term, but it's a great way of uh, actually doing your Office 365 migration and keeping your email security in place at the same time. Because then you can use that solution to in, uh, make sure that you're securing your email traffic and you're not changing all that technology out at the same time. You can even use the solution, uh, at least in terms of Cisco's solution, to actually help you maybe when you're in the hybrid mode to actually address the email for the users that are in Office 365 to Office 365, and then the email for the user that is still on-prem that can still go to the uh, on-premise Exchange server. So the Cisco email security solution can actually help you in that hybrid mode at the same time. So what you're saying is you don't necessarily need to avail of a cloud-based email security solution straight off the bat and that most uh, solutions will support some sort of a hybrid mode between on-prem and cloud from day one? Yes, correct. Uh, and actually, the other big benefit you have of doing that uh, is not only are you keeping your email security in place, but it also gives you the opportunity to help measure how much value your email security is providing to your Office 365 environment as you actually migrate to it. So, sure, your, uh, by default, your email security uh, solution will be blocking and quarantining, but there's actually no reason why you can't change that configuration so that you're only tagging in your email security solution, allowing that email go into Office 365, and then you know straight away whether it's going to be detected in Office 365, or if it's not, you've already tagged it, so you can uh, pretty easily measure the actual value that uh, email security is going on top of Office 365. So it's a good idea to keep it in place. You own it, you might as well keep on using it, 
And also you can use it to enforce your outbound email policy as well, uh, because certainly that's something uh, that Office 365 uh, has a little less functionality in. Um, that's a good point, and it actually brings up a clarification that I had for you, um, and that is that some of our customers would benefit if they migrated from on-prem to cloud, they get some additional capabilities with our cloud solution. Can you share more specifics on that? Yeah, sure. So if you're using Cisco on-premise appliances, whether they're physical or virtual appliances, and you're going to migrate up to Cisco's cloud email security solution, uh, the big advantage that we have, and quite a unique advantage actually in the marketplace, is that the cloud system is built using the same technology as the on-premise products. And that enables someone to very much you know, export their configuration out of their on-premise solution, import it into the cloud solution, and be up and going very quickly. The other big advantage here actually is our cloud system uh, also has dedicated environments for customers, dedicated IPs, so that uh, if a, uh, for example, there's no way that another customer could impact the reputation of those IPs uh, and maybe affect your ability to send email. And we do certainly have seen that with other, you know, multi-tenant type path solutions, where you've got multiple organizations all sharing that same IP address, you can have some reputation issues there. So uh, probably a, a little bit more detail than, than I was looking for right there. Um, but something that, that pops up quite frequently um, when I'm talking to organizations and when my team are talking to organizations is that um, these organizations believe that the capabilities within Microsoft Office 365 are sufficient for them. So we frequently, frequently see customers not renewing their Cisco email security subscriptions after they move to Office 365, but then just as frequently within months, sometimes weeks, those customers come back to us because they're not happy with the capabilities of Office 365, be it email management or security efficacy. Um, is this something that you see as well? Yeah, we see it all the time. Uh, and in fact, as well as you know, customers from other email security solutions uh, con contacting us to you know supplement the the core capabilities in Office 365. Um, there's many areas um, that uh, a customer uh, can find value in and may need to supplement the core capability in Office 365. So the most uh, common area that we see coming up is actually affecting the help desk. Wow, okay, I, I really wasn't expecting that. Can, can you share some more on that? And, and that's the surprising thing, because people don't. But what you've got to think about here is when you're migrating to Office 365 and relying just on the Office 365, uh, in this instance, the spam engine, you're changing out a core background security engine, uh, being the spam detection engine. I know it's not the most sexiest thing we have in the world, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I like to give plenty of stick to our competitors, but all the leading vendors, you know, we're all pretty good at detecting spam these days. I mean, when is the last time that uh, you've seen a spam message in your inbox at Cisco? An actual spam? You know, I, I actually can't remember. So the, when you're changing out that spam detection engine, uh, you know, you're changing out that technology in the back end. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, over 20 years, Cisco has been working on uh, email security uh, with Cisco and, and Ironport before that. So you do get very good at that over a period of time. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, the Office 365 technology is, uh, you know, very substandard. I mean, it's very good in what it does, but it might only let through, you know, ones and twos, but that's enough. And what happens is your users aren't used to email uh, spam, you know, turning up their inboxes. So they can't remember what they're meant to do. Uh, am I meant to report it? Am I meant to click some button in Outlook? I just don't remember because I haven't seen it for so long. So everybody calls the help desk, but the problem is they all call the help desk at the same time for a very non-critical issue. So that impacts the help desk. And then the next thing we typically see is uh, reports of what we call uh, you know, false positives. So that's a legitimate email that has been incorrectly classified as spam or an email that is missing out of a user's inbox. So then the users start calling the help desk to say, I was expecting this message, but it hasn't turned up. Uh, can you help me? And then of course the help desk needs to learn message tracking in Office 365 very quickly. Okay, so point taken. You mentioned that organizations need to make an informed decision about you know, whether or not they use a third party email security solution in addition to Office 365. Can you share some more specifics in terms of those exact considerations they need to take into account. Yeah, absolutely. So what a customer needs to do, whether it's related to Cisco email security or some other third-party email security solution, is just look at Office 365 and consider all the areas in Office 365 where they may, may need to supplement some of that core capability. So they need to understand those areas. They need to understand how they actually work. Because it's very important not to do a tick box compare. Office 365 has a spam engine, 
uh, Cisco email security has a spam engine, but the spam engines are very different. So you need to be very careful not to tick box compare that list of functionality. And actually, to be honest, that's the biggest mistake I see customers making. One example of uh, you know, where you need to be careful of doing this tick box compare is with spam quarantine management. Not the most sexiest feature uh, I know that uh, exists, but uh, you know, spam quarantine management is a capability that a lot of organizations rely on to take the load off their actual help desk. So it enables the end users to come in and actually manage their own spam quarantine. So if something has been mistakenly quarantined, then they can actually release it out of the spam quarantine. So it's a functionality we see a lot of large enterprises, a lot of organizations using around the world. And how this actually works with Office 365 is you've actually got two ways of quarantining email. Either it can go into the junk folder or it can go into a, a web-based quarantine, quite similar actually to the Cisco's one. But the issue you kind of, the core cool problem you have here with Office 365 is that there's very little categorization of email when it has been detected as spam. So it's basically is spam, is not spam. So if you allow your end users to manage uh, that uh, quarantine spam, then the issue you have is enforcing a safe working environment. Because remember, spam can have lots of different types of spam. It can be malicious spam with malware attached. It can be inappropriate or pornographic spam. Uh, it can be grain mail or newsletters and things like that as well. So you've got to be very careful what you provide your users access to. What Cisco Email Security does is brings an enterprise class feature set in this area. So for example, uh, we only allow uh, end users to uh, manage uh, you know, the, the spam that is safe. We don't allow end users to make the decision about whether something is malicious or pornographic or something like that. We enforce that safe working environment. And that's just one of the areas uh, where you need to be very careful. And if you didn't understand how both of those two areas work, then you're not making that tick box comparison between the two different environments. There are many other areas in email security to, to uh, consider as well. Known malware um, recognition, embedded URLs, you know, the real sort of security uh, uh, facets of the actual solution. But you have to think about more than just security as well. It also comes into management and reporting and some of the things you actually mentioned in the introduction uh, to the actual webinar. We need to make sure uh, that the, from a security viewpoint, you know, we're keeping the bad stuff out, we're keeping your inboxes safe. But from a management viewpoint, or maybe even a policy engine viewpoint, can it do everything that you need it to do? Can you actually even replicate all the email policy that you have configured in your current solution in Office 365? It's something to definitely look at. So not only can you recreate what you've got now, but also can it do what might be needed tomorrow as well? Very critical thing to look at. So, so why do you see the policy engine as being so important? And uh, that's a great question. And uh, thank you for asking it, because the policy engine is one of my favorite parts of the product. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the issue you have around the policy engine, or, or the, the reason why a policy engine is so important, is really just in this environment of ever-increasing rhetoric compliance that organizations have to go through. You know, GLBA in, the, in Europe, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, mandatory data breach notifications down in Australia, uh, you know, it's just coming at us uh, at a rate of knots. So uh, these sorts of regulatory compliance requirements typically require uh, an advanced policy engine to be able to support them from an email security viewpoint. And the more advanced uh, and capable the policy engine is, then the more likelihood that it's going to be able to support what you need today, but also the unknown of what you're going to need tomorrow. So for example, the Cisco email policy engine uh, has you know, 24 rule conditions or you know, when a rule is actually going to trigger. It has 26 rule actions, so what the rule is actually going to do when it does trigger. But it's not necessarily the numbers, it's actually what those options are that really make it very powerful. That sounds pretty compelling. Can you um, perhaps demonstrate some of these capabilities within the product for us? Absolutely love to. Most of sales organizations have a generic sales inbox that is monitored manually by sales staff, well at least hopefully. Let's use the advanced policy engine within email security, Cisco Email Security, to make it a smart inbox with an autoresponder. So first of all, log in to the Instant Demo instance and select Mail Policies Text Resources from the main menu. The text resources can be used as notification messages for a whole range of situations. He will create a new notification to use as an autoresponder when a prospect sends a sales inquiry email. So click on Add Text Resource to add a new notification message. Entering the name that we're going to use and the actual type, it has to be a notification template, to add the new notification message. Now I can actually click on Insert Variables to bring up a list of all the different variables I can actually add to the textual uh, piece of my notification message.
So for example, simply clicking on one of these variables adds it to the actual uh, notification template itself. So we can use these variables to further personalize the notification message back to our prospect. After you're happy with the actual message itself, just close the insert variables and click submit. This saves the notification template. Now that we've completed that autoresponder message, that would be sent back to the actual prospect sending us sales inquiries. The next step is to create an incoming content filter which will be called from the policy we create in the last step. So now we need to go to mail policies and incoming content filters. The incoming content filter policies are run after all the connection and security policies and are used when you want to define a policy based on the content within an email message itself. The order of the content policies is very important because they execute top down. So as soon as a policy triggers, those actions will be taken. You must be careful that you do not have conflicting policies. Click on Add Filter to add a new content filter. The two parts of an incoming content filter are the rule conditions, which is what needs to happen in order to trigger the policy, and then the actions, which are which actions the policy will take when the actual uh, filter has been triggered. The filter settings are simply to give it a name, um, and note that spaces are not supported, show which policies are currently calling this filter, who can edit the policy if you have delegated administration set up. In this case we have either the full administrator as we have now or a read-only administrator uh, which I can actually see when I click on that message. And then I can actually put a more detailed description uh, within the actual filter itself. And then the order that the filter should sit in, remembering the top-down execution uh, model that we uh, use. So now that we've given our incoming content filter a name, we can go through and add a condition. And here are a list of the 24 different current options when it comes to adding a condition to an incoming content filter. In this case, we're going to use message body or attachment. And I can simply click on contains text, type in the text that I'm looking for, in this case we're going to use firewall, and then click OK. That text box also supports regular expressions to support more advanced text matching requirements. Now that we have our filter condition, we can add a filter action. So click on the Add Action button. And this brings up the 26 currently available filter actions. Here we're going to use the Change Recipient To option to simply redirect the incoming sales inquiry email to the right team who can help them straight away. So since this is a firewall inquiry, we'll type in firewallsales at cisco.com that we're going to use inside this example. And then click OK. So what we've done so far is to set up the automated redirect to the right sales team. Now we need to add the action that will also send the autoresponder notification message back to our, our prospect. So the incoming content filter currently should look similar to the, the example shown here. We're having one condition and one action. If I go and add another action, this time I can uh, click the notify option and complete the settings. So I'm going to choose to send the notification message back to the actual sender and I'm simply going to select the autoresponder uh, template that we created originally and I'll include the original message as an attachment and again click OK to save our settings. So now the incoming content filter is looking for the word firewall within the message body or attachment. It's going to change and when that triggers it's going to change the recipient to firewallsales at cisco.com and then also send the notification message that we've previously created back to the actual prospect itself. So click on submit to save all these changes. The final part of this puzzle is to actually create the policy itself. So if you simply go into mail policies and incoming mail policies here, and then I can add a policy uh, to my existing list. So we start by giving the policy a name. We can also define which uh, administrators can actually edit the actual policy. And then of course the uh, policy um, order. And again, uh, email policies execute top down. So make sure it's sitting before the default policy, which should always be the last policy in the list as kind of a catch can to catch any email that has not been previously triggered uh, or processed by any previous policy. Now I can click on the add the user option to define which email addresses we should apply this policy to. Now there are a lot of options here, but basically we want our policy to apply to any, in, any sender, so any incoming email, but only for uh, email sent to sales at cisco.com. So I simply type that in here, make sure I don't change anything else, and click OK at the bottom of the screen. So now my incoming email policy, uh, I've given it a name, I've worked out uh, what uh, 
rule order it's going to run in and I've added uh, the actual users so only this policy will only trigger for email being sent to sales at cisco.com so let's go ahead and hit submit so I can now see my new policy on my list of email policies so we've got two final tasks to complete the first is to make sure the policy is using the content filter we defined previously so all I do is hover over content filters within my actual policy click that and then I just need to drop this list down to customize. I want to enable the content filters, but customize the settings. Deselect all the other content filters, except for the one that we created. Simple as that. Now I can see my policy for the automated sales inbox is using the sales autoresponder firewall content filter. Now the final task that we uh, have to do after we've made sure everything's been set up properly is to commit the actual changes. So in summary, let's just review what we've just set up in this scenario. So we set up a new policy that will apply to any email address to sales at cisco.com. It will look for any instance of the word firewall in the body of the email. And of course, I can create additional filters for the, uh, to support all the other products that I might want to. It will automatically send an immediate confirmation email back to the actual sender, acknowledging their interest. Great customer response. And it will also reroute the email to the firewall sales team by changing the recipient address of the email message itself. Just one example of how I can use the advanced uh, policy engine within Cisco email security. Okay, that's pretty impressive. I need that. So let's hear from a customer about how they actually find the experience with Office 365 and what some of the value is that they get out of using Cisco email security together with Office 365. here at Delta Plastics of the South. It is very important to us to take care of the environment find ways to help farmers conserve water and keep the plastic out of the landfills. My name is Philip Collins. I'm the IT manager at Delta Plastics of the South. We manufacture irrigation tubing for the agricultural industry. And we also take that tubing once it's been used and recycle it and make uh, recycled garbage bags. When I first got here, we had made the move to Office 365, but we were beginning to grow and with Office 365, they have systems in place to do some security scanning. They have some systems to tell you if things are going wrong, but it doesn't really dig deep into the email and analyze everything that could be going on inside that email. So I was seeing a lot of emails still getting through that should, in my opinion, have been caught that were malware or spyware. We get emails all the time that claim to be from our CEO asking us to click on the link and put our data in. People need to realize it's really easy to get that information and to use it to try to scam somebody out of something. So I began looking at solutions that looked at the bigger picture. I chose Cisco email security because I felt like its feature set, its stability, and what benefits it were gonna give me far outweighed anybody else's solution. I think we've seen a far greater increase in security than maybe we even expected. There were definitely some times where I had to do a lot of digging to find out what Office 365's tools would offer me, whereas something in Cisco was just a couple clicks away. If you think about going with Office 365 as your sole method of protection on your network, there's going to come a day when something gets through that you weren't expecting, that you weren't notified about, that you didn't see, that Cisco could have helped you with. Since they've come along and better helped us manage our systems and better help us manage what's coming in and out of our email, to me, there's a lot more confidence. When I'm working out in the field and I'm delivering emails, I know that anything, all emails are safe whenever they come through and I don't have to worry about any type of threats. One of the reasons I chose Cisco Email Security, not only was it in the cloud and gave me that flexibility, but it has AMP built into it. AMP is a technology they have that does proactive monitoring and proactive updates from their Talos network. Talos is like the Pentagon. It's security experts sitting around watching stuff all day long and determining whether or not it's good or bad. And then sending all that information out to all these appliances around the world. They're constantly looking at threats. They're constantly looking at what's going on in the internet, what's going on in the real world. They're analyzing those threats. It's a great tool. 
and knowing that those people are actually there looking over my shoulder and I'm not having to do it myself. I would recommend Cisco Email Security to any company looking to protect their email systems. It's just a simple fact people can do their jobs quicker, faster, more efficiently, and we don't have to deal with these calls and these email tickets every day. It saves us a ton of time we can be working on things more productively. It's worth every penny you're paying for it. So we've covered all of these feature and capability areas. Let's get down to brass tacks. Let's talk about commercials and let's talk, talk about the kind of mix of solutions that a customer could uh, deploy Cisco's email security with. And another great question. There are so many options when it comes with Office 365, different levels of licensing, uh, many different levels of licensing from Cisco email security as well. At the end of the day, Cisco is an Office 365 customer as well. We use this ourselves. Uh, and uh, you know Cisco uses uh, E3 license level with obviously Cisco email security to supplement those core capabilities. So this combination uh, provides all the core capabilities in Office 365 with an enterprise class email security solution. So the combination of E3 and, and Cisco email security provides all the core capabilities that our uh, organization is going to need. Uh, one of the other big questions we get asked is do I really need to run uh, what Microsoft call ATP or advanced threat protection? Uh, and basically looking into ATP, there's three core parts uh, within ATP. That is safe links, safe attachments, and advanced mission controls. All these are easily taken care of within the actual Cisco email security solution that you're supplementing in here with Office 365. So you do not need to take ATP as well on top. Looking at the higher level of Microsoft licensing, the E5 level, you know, there's lots of features and functions that are actually within E5, not to mention, uh, you know, ATP being built into that. But there's, you know, some of the advanced email archiving may be required, some of the advanced DLP features may be required, although we have a good level of DLP uh, or data loss prevention within Cisco email security. But there's a lot of other features and functions, for example, the, the uh, meetings and the uh, VoIP functionality, uh, you know, all that stuff, which of course, you know, Cisco has fantastic solutions for as well. So uh, maybe uh, E5 is not required either. So Bradley, this has all been great information. But can you give us some solid practical steps for how a prospective user of Cisco Email Security can get started? Absolutely. So uh, essentially, I normally recommend uh, six different steps to actually look at. So it's a bit of a process to move through. The first step is all about looking at your current email policy. Can you actually, and I've mentioned this before already, but can you replicate your current email policy within Office 365? Yes or no? You need to be checking this. And a lot of organizations don't do this pretty important step when they're going through and doing their testing and evaluation of uh, Office 365. Can Microsoft support everything you need, not only today, but then you also you need to think about tomorrow when we talked about the Advanced Policy Engine. The second step is actually validating the email security capabilities. Now there's different ways of actually doing this. And perhaps this is the area that uh, a lot of organizations try and concentrate on when they're trying to work out about the value uh, that uh, another email security solution can bring to Office 365. So whether you've got the email security solution running uh, in line or BCCing messages to it, you need to make sure that it's capturing everything you need it to capture. So one of the uh, largest problem security issues that we see in the marketplace today is called BEC, or Business Email Compromise. These are, you know, the uh, very simple messages. There's no attachment. There's no embedded URL. Looks like it comes from the CEO. Uh, urgently, can you do this wire transfer or go out and buy gift cards? Or, you know, maybe I can, uh, you know, I'm asking you to change my bank account details. You know, it's not really me asking you. It's the attacker. Uh, but these messages are very difficult to detect. And in very, fact, they're very realistic. Yes. It's very difficult for a technology solution to try and, and detect and block. Yeah, absolutely. There's very little to protect on. And it's the sense of urgency. So they're also playing on the uh, kind of human uh, aspect here as well. But how well that solution is actually covering, uh, you know, BEC is a critical decision you need to look at. I've seen so many organizations, large and small, all over the world, you know, being really badly impacted through uh, BEC alone. For, from a security viewpoint, it's not just about embedded URLs, uh, embedded uh, or attached uh, viruses, etc. cetera. Uh, BEC also has to be on that list of things to look at. So the third area is all around advanced phishing detection. So while we have some base capability in the product for phishing detection, as uh, you know, a little bit less than Office 365, uh, if your organization is particularly susceptible to uh, phishing attacks and business email compromise, then you also need to be looking at how you can supplement that core capability with some more advanced uh, capability. 
So ATP, for example, Office 365 brings you know, a list of senior execs. We actually do that within the base product. But then we also have an optional add-on module called Advanced Phishing Protection, which brings you know, AI type models to this whole area. So it's a completely new way of actually detecting you know, these advanced phishing uh, attacks. And email security today is changing so much. The threat landscape is evolving so quickly. You know, we have to innovate like we've never innovated before to make sure that we can stay ahead of the actual attack. So the fourth step is all about management, and that's day-to-day -day management. And remember, you've got to live with the solution every day. So how easy is it to search for quarantine email? How easy it is for to release quarantine email? How safe is it for your end users to be releasing that quarantine email? This is some, another area uh, that you need to look at and consider when you're looking at these different areas. And then the fifth step is actually reporting. So do you have any executive reports that you're sending uh, to your upper management, for example, on a regular basis? Would you like to be? Are there reports that you run on a regular basis? Is HR, for example, human resources, logging in and maybe running some reports around acceptable uh, usage policies, etc.? Can you replicate all those within Office 365? This is a, a, an area, reporting is the other critical area really to look at inside your evaluation. And reporting is always an area that is very undervalued when it comes to demos and evaluations. So please make sure that you look at reporting. And then the sixth and final step is all around external domain protection. So while you know, Office 365 doesn't have any functionality here at all, uh, we're seeing uh, you know, external domain protection as being an emerging requirement for email security teams. And uh, you know, while it hasn't really got a whole lot to do with keeping the bad stuff out and keeping the good stuff in, which is what we're typically doing, it's around how am I protecting and reporting on my external domains and how they're being used externally. So are they being used inside phishing attacks, for example, because that's going to be uh, you know, adversely damaging to your brand. Have you become you know, what's called DMARC compliant? So are you, you know, a good sender when it comes to enforcing those sorts of policies? So external domain protection or using a solution like Cisco domain protection, for example, as a tool set can really help you uh, nail this area as well. Thanks, Brian. This has been great. So do you want to maybe sum it all up for us now? Sure. So what we've discussed today is perhaps not every organization is going to need to supplement uh, email security with a, an, an external email security solution when they're running Office 365. But I think if you're drilling into these areas and considering them properly, not doing a tick box compare, but actually understanding how these areas work, that's how you're going to work out the value to your organization of maybe continuing to run an external email security solution. It's very important to make sure that you're considering a solution that meets your current as well as your future needs. You have such a great opportunity here to rethink the email policies, maybe go through and review some of those email policies that you've been running for a long time. Like firewalls, email security solutions, time and time again, have all these policies in it that were created by someone somewhere at some stage, not really quite sure what they're doing today. So a great opportunity to go through and optimize your email policy and make sure that uh, it is doing everything that your organization needs. The other opportunity you have here is to use your email security solution for a lot more than just security. And yes, it's back to my favorite subject, the policy engine, because organizations can use their email security solution for so much more than just email security. If you have a look at the demonstration that we did before around you know, creating an intelligent sales inbox, that's just one small example. There are so many more uh, ways that I've seen uh, customers using email security products to add true business value over and above security. It's really quite exciting finding that stuff out. So when you're looking into your Office 365 uh, migration and you're considering whether uh, you know, you're going to need a third-party email security solution or not, please make sure you take the time to make a careful, informed decision. Look at all these different areas. Don't tick box compare features. Make sure you understand how they work and how they're going to actually apply to your organization. And make sure that you're looking at security. Obviously, email security is an important thing. But go beyond that and also think about the management and the reporting capabilities as well. So critically important. This could be the opportunity to add some real business value to your organization. So I hope this webinar has been of use. You've got the information that you're after. And I really wish you the best of luck in whichever path you choose going forward. Bradley, thank you so much for your time today. It's been very enlightening. And to our wonderful audience, thank you very much for your time today. For a free, full-featured trial of Cisco Email Security, please scan the QR code that you see on your screen right now. And for a recording of today's webinar, as well as lots more information, you can refer to the links on screen now. Thank you. Between what is hoped for and what can be, there's a bridge.
Between the aspirations of a ball club and the greatest sports venue in America, there's a bridge. Between chaos and wonder, endangered and protected, there's a bridge. Built on technology that can solve, create, heal, inspire, 